Most of the COVID restrictions in Scotland will be lifted today when the country moves beyond the current level zero rules. Physical distancing restrictions and limits on gatherings will be removed and all venues will be allowed to reopen. But face coverings will still need to be worn in many public spaces, including schools. Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, joins us now live from Glasgow. Good morning to you. Morning. Good morning. Good to see you this morning. So sort of lots of positivity about the lifting of restrictions north of the border today. Lots of our viewers getting in touch saying this is great news. We're, we're really feeling like it's time that we get a chance. However, is there slight nervousness, Nicholas Sturgeon, about the fact that the cases week on week sort of seem to rise a little bit over the weekend and also the closeness of lifting the restrictions to when the children are going back to school north of the border, which, of course, they do sooner than ours down here in England. There is sort of concern from some parents saying, are we doing this too soon when the kids are about to go back to school and they could be mixing together and those figures could go up again? Uh, so, yes, I, I think there's always going to be nervousness when we lift restrictions after such a long period. And, um, I, yeah, I have to be honest that... Uh, there's some butterflies in my stomach about it today, but I think it's the right moment to do this. Uh, we see daily fluctuations in our case numbers, but the trend is downwards. Um, and of course, the vaccine is giving significant protection. Um, so this is the right moment to remove legal restrictions, to try to get that greater normality back in our lives. But with a big caveat that the virus hasn't gone away. Uh, the pandemic is not over. I think it's premature to declare victory over it or freedom from it. We've got to continue to be careful, which is why in Scotland we are keeping some sensible precautions in place. For example, face coverings in many indoor settings. So it's a moment to feel optimistic. This has been a, a long, hard year and a half, but we've got to continue to exercise care and caution. This virus is unpredictable and... I think it's true that we underestimate it at our peril. So let's try to strike the right balance as we feel perhaps um, a bit more optimistic than we've had cause to do for quite yeah. some time. You have been cautious. <coughs> You're more cautious in terms of keeping those restrictions than, than in England. Uh, uh, delaying some of the lifting restrictions after England did in July the 19th. But the argument for Westminster... One of the arguments from Westminster for that July the 19th date being set when it was is because there tends to be a two week lag after lifting restrictions before you see an impact on how the changes in restrictions might have on cases. And they wanted to make sure there was enough time for that to be felt and managed before schools going back. Why did you decide not to have a gap? Well, we have had a gap. So on the 19th of July, when England lifted all legal restrictions, we had a further easing of restrictions then. So we've done it more gradually, but there has been change right throughout that period. Um, on the 19th of July, we simply didn't have the, the final lifting of all restrictions. So it's not just about being more cautious. It's about doing it at a slower, but also steadier pace. So we... Uh, have had the two weeks uh, since, or the, the week since the 19th of July now, to see the impact on our cases. What, what I think we've all got to recognise in whatever country, whatever part of the world, is that as soon as we lift any restrictions, we give the virus more opportunities to spread because uh, we are coming together more than would have previously been the case. So we've got to factor that into all of our thinking. We do lots of forward modelling to look at the different uh, impacts that changes might have. But of course, the big change now is the vaccine. We should be very positive about that, although also realistic that the vaccine doesn't completely stop people getting the virus. But we do see the evidence that it is reducing the impact of serious health harm from the virus. So all of these things are positive. But I say again, you know, we we must recognise that, firstly, this is a global pandemic. Uh, none of us will be out of it until the whole world is out of it. So the virus is still there. We've got to treat it with care and caution. So I would say to people across Scotland today, as we see the remainder of these legal restrictions lift, continue to be sensible. Wear your face coverings, particularly indoors. Stay outdoors as much as possible. Ventilate rooms if you're inside. And although the law doesn't demand it, because we can't keep legal restrictions on people's lives in place, forever. It still is sensible if you're 
in a place with people from other households, if you can, keep a safe distance from them. All of these sensible steps and precautions yeah. will help us make this move today, but hopefully keep cases under control. So with the with the face mask still being worn in public, public transport, and I know that I think uh, students and schools are going to have to wear them for the first six weeks of term. Will you be looking at the data and deciding whether they will stay in place, those restrictions, beyond that if there is a surge in cases? Uh, of course, you know, I, again, a bit like not declaring victory over this virus. I, I with every fibre of my being, I hope that the restrictions being lifted today never, ever have to be reimposed. But nobody, no leader anywhere can guarantee this. This is an unpredictable infectious virus. So we have to monitor all of these things. Face coverings in schools in particular, we'll be monitoring that carefully and we will not keep that requirement in place for any longer than necessary. People sometimes ask me just now, why do young people still need to wear face coverings in schools when there are some other settings where that's not required? Of course, young people for now remain unvaccinated, although we are starting to vaccinate 16 and 17 year olds. And, and unlike nightclubs, which are places that people have a choice over whether or not they go to, that's not the case with schools. So there's something quite unique about the school setting. Young, unvaccinated people uh, together with older people, but also young people don't have a choice about being in school. So keeping some basic precautions there for a bit longer as schools return strikes me as sensible. It's certainly the clinical advice I've got. But of course, we don't want to see young people having to do that for yeah. longer than we deem is necessary. So we'll review it carefully and regularly. We have uh, Kwasi Kwarteng, the uh, Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy Secretary, um, on the programme for UK Government um, a little bit later on, after 8 o'clock. Uh, he has promised um, an energy announcement that he's going to give us. And, of course, we'll also be talking to him about something that I know is close to your heart. It's the UK government looking to approve proposals uh, for the Cambo oil and gas field contracts that were originally approved back in 2001, I think. And now uh, they're looking again to approve it because it's near the seabed near Shetland. Do you feel yeah. comfortable knowing that you're hosting the huge, you know, COP26 conference in Glasgow in November and all that you have talked about, about taking seriously climate change? We're looking at the situation in Greece, which many attribute directly to climate change problems, fires causing devastation there, amongst all sorts of other problems around the world and feel like you want to campaign against that, as Keir Starmer has for the approval of it. What's your position? What would you like us to pass on to Kwasi Kardang about your position over that? Well, I'll, I'll pass it on directly in, in due course. Um, we're thinking carefully about this right now, and I'll, we'll see the IPCC report later today, which I think will be a, a grim wake-up call for all of us. You asked if I'm, if I'm comfortable. I'm not comfortable that any of us in positions of leadership are, are yet doing enough. We've got world-leading targets, but we've got to challenge ourselves to make sure we're doing everything to meet those targets. On the specific issue of Campbell, in Scotland we've got a big oil and gas industry, it employs thousands of people. We've got to make sure that our transition away from oil and gas is a just one, where we don't do what happened with the coal industry and leave individuals and communities on the scrap heap. So we have to consider these things carefully. But there's a big question about what, what, whether what I've just said there is commensurate uh, with new exploration of oil and gas. So these are the things we are considering carefully. I intend to write to the Prime Minister later this week, encouraging greater cooperation, cooperation between the governments of the UK in light of the IPCC report. And I'll say more about our position on the Campbell issue at that time. What's your view on it, though? What's your... Because, uh, obviously, all governments have to look at economy and industry and the right thing for the planet. That, that's the balance every, everyone has to make. And have you been able to form a view? I, I know there's, there's a lot of reports and talk of you possibly forming a coalition with the Scottish Greens that I don't think they would be very happy about it, would they? So is, is politics also part of this? Um, politics shouldn't be part of this, our concern and responsibility to the planet, but also to communities and jobs that are dependent, whether we like it or not, on a current industry. What's my view? I absolutely understand 
uh, I was going to say concerns, the profound concerns about uh, licences for new exploration, and that being quite distinct from the, the current uh, state of the oil and gas industry. Um, so I understand those concerns. I, I share some of that disquiet. And as First Minister of Scotland, I, it's not our decision in terms of this licence for exploration, but people rightly want to know what we think, and we will uh, make that view clear uh, to the UK government. I think it is absolutely the case that we can't, whether we like it or not, we can't simply move away from oil and gas overnight, not least for energy needs. We don't want to suddenly be importing energy, which isn't good for our carbon footprint either. And we really do need to be serious about jobs and about communities dependent on that industry and make sure we transition away from that in a fair and just way. But that uh, is not necessarily the same as supporting new exploration and these are the issues that we, yeah. like governments everywhere, uh, are considering carefully. And I absolutely understand that people want to hear uh, clearly from me what the Scottish Government position is. And we will uh, continue to set out our views okay. on this as we uh, make those considerations. But all of us uh, have a very serious moral obligation, and I use that term advisedly, moral obligation to our planet and to future generations. And it's one that I take seriously, and it's one that I, uh, like leaders everywhere deserve to be very seriously challenged on day by day. Yes, and, and undoubtedly you will be. Uh, I'm sure one of the things that you have enjoyed over the last uh, couple of weeks in amongst everything else that's on your roster is the success of Team GB at the Olympics, not least the Scottish uh, athletes that are returning. Many of them, some are back already. Many of them are coming back uh, today uh, and, and looking forward to it. I wonder how much pride you've had in, in the success of those Scottish athletes and whether there's any plans to have a sort of parade for them uh, at some point when you can get them all up north of the border. Uh, we want to celebrate them and we want to do something appropriate to, to mark their achievements uh, and, and we'll set out plans for that in due course. I, I feel real proud, pride in all of the Team GB athletes, those from Scotland and those from other parts of the UK. They, they have done every part of the UK uh, really proud. I mean, Jason Kenny, um, and Laura Kenny, you know, some of the, well, Jason is now the, the most celebrated uh, GB Olympian ever, but some of the Scottish athletes, uh, Duncan Scott in the, the pool, Laura Muir on the track, many of the others, I'm, I'm sure. Also, many people would have shed a tear of joy watching Tom Daly and, and his achievements. So it's been a fantastic performance all round, and my hearty congratulations go to each and every one of them. Yeah, I bet. I wonder, sure. um, we, were, we were all smiling uh, when we, <laughs> we saw a tweet of you visiting a nursery near Stirling. Um, you get some fun in amongst the series. We, we can't you? see your feet today. Did you get your shoes back? Nick? Did you get your shoes back? Because they were borrowed by, <laughs> by one of the little girls. I, I took my shoes off to, to kick a ball with a little boy at the nursery. And as I was doing that, a, a little girl, her name is Emma, I think she was about three years old, uh, ran away with my shoes. Uh, straight for the cameras, I might add. I think she, <laughs> she knew, she saw her moment. But eventually I rested my shoes back from her. But I, I think I spotted a, a first minister of the future in little Emma. Oh, yeah, she <laughs> knows, knows what to take a wants. moment and yeah, run exactly. with it, doesn't yes. she? Uh, Nicola Sturgeon, thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you.